everybody. Well, at 8 o'clock, we'll be talking about the debate, which begins at 8.30. Um, it's going to be on Sky, and it's going to be with Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn. It is not, I hasten not, a head-to-head -head debate between the two of them, sadly, because the Prime Minister has absolutely point-blank refused to do one of those. But uh, Corbyn will go first. He'll be grilled, he'll be interviewed, he will then face audience questions, and then Theresa May will follow on. Uh, it'll take place from half past eight until ten, and you can listen to all of it live on LBC, and you won't miss a thing. So at eight o'clock, we'll be talking about that. Now, when I was last with you on Thursday, we talked about the fact that there were 3,500 jihadi terrorist suspects in this country, and we were talking about what on earth do we do about this number of people, and one of the questions I teased was, well, why was this horrendous Manchester bomber, the loser from Manchester, why was he not on that list of three and a half thousand? And we did sort of ask, I wonder how many more people there are. Well, we didn't have to wait very long until the bombshell hit us on Saturday morning in the newspapers. The number of people who are subjects of interest, which means they're on a list that says they are either directly associated with dangerous terrorist suspects, or they have at some point in time been looked at and investigated, which of course includes this Abedi character, that the number is 23,000. I don't know how you felt on Saturday morning when you heard that figure. I felt profoundly depressed, and I'm asking you tonight, given that we have a general election just 11 days away, which leader would you most trust with the future security of this country? Now, one of the reasons I felt depressed about it is I have been talking about this subject for some time. In fact, here was my warning about homegrown jihadism back in 2015. Look, I, you know, we've been very, very good over the last decade and more about worrying what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa and, Afghan and, and Afghanistan. And we've been very busy intervening in all these places and we've been almost negligent in the growth of jihadism within our own communities. And when I said last year, to the usual howls of outrage, when I said last year that we now have a fifth column living inside our own countries, they carry our passports, they speak our language and they hate us. They want to kill us. They want to overthrow our culture, our constitution, our whole way of life. My own view is we should worry a bit more about what's happening within our countries than what is happening across the rest of the world. Well, I said that back in 2015, but I originally started in 2014 campaigning hard on this point that, yes, of course, I've always talked about the risks of unfettered immigration, of not knowing who's coming into the country, of, of, of not being able to security check who come from potentially dangerous parts of the world. But that is only part of the problem. The other part of the problem is homegrown jihadism. And yeah, sure, the internet plays a role in this. And some schools play a role in this. And certainly prisons play a role in this. But of course, mosques also do play a role in this. I mean, the Didsbury Mosque, the mosque where Abedi and his family had worshipped, they had visiting preachers over the course of the last few years who said that homosexuals should be put to death and that indeed non-believers should be put to death. Why was this allowed to go on inside our own country? Well, I think you know what I think. I've said it before. We've been so PC, we've been frightened of appearing to crack down on one community for fear of it being thought racist. So I have to be frank, I don't have terrific confidence in Theresa May. I don't think, as Home Secretary, she tackled this. It's difficult for me to believe that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is either going to be particularly tough on this. I mean, May is saying she's going to appoint a new terrorism czar. Uh, Corbyn is talking about cuts uh, and, 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 and the fact that he put more police on the streets and he give MI5 and MI6 greater resources. Nick Clegg, on behalf of the Lib Dems, is warning us that leaving the European Union risks are being cut off from vital intelligence sharing platforms. And Paul Nuttall is, for UKIP, is, as we speak, uh, doing an interview with another broadcaster and we'll perhaps come back to his comments later on in the show. So I'm asking you, I'm feeling a bit down about all this. 
I mean, I really think we should have cracked down on this a long, long time ago. So who do you think, under which leader, would you feel the future security of our country was best placed? Please call me on 0345 6060 973, text at 84850. You can tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage and LBC, and you can watch us live on the Facebook page now. Who is the best leader for our future security? And I'm going to go to Martin in New Cross first. Martin, good evening. Evening, Nigel. How are you? I'm well. well. Do you know, I'm normally, whatever the political problem, I'm always looking for positive answers. And I'm just a bit blown away, Martin, by this figure of 23,000. I feel very, very down about it. It's, it's shocking. And the thought, on a similar subject, the thought of Jeremy Corbyn and Diane Abbott running this country, when you've got that, you've got the uncontrolled migration problems, uh, that's pretty scary, the thought of those two in power. Oh, God forbid if a terrorist attack happened, having those two, you know, working with the security forces, trying to prevent it, I mean, that's enough to scare anybody. Well, you, I mean, Martin, you, you talk about uncontrolled immigration, and you're quite right uh, that in this campaign there is clearly no desire from Abbott or from Corbyn to control immigration numbers to Britain. But then uh, there wasn't under Theresa May, really, was there either? I mean, she was the Home Secretary, Martin, for six years, where we saw net migration running at up to a third of a million people every single year. I absolutely agree. I mean, I am no, you know, fanatical cheerleader for Theresa May either. But if it is a choice between her and Jeremy Corbyn, well, there really isn't a choice. I mean, you just have to look at some of Jeremy Corbyn's recent, you know, some of the things that have been revealed about some of his links with the IRA, Hamas. I mean, I don't think there's a banned terrorist organisation on planet Earth. He hasn't had some <laughs> sort of sympathy well, for in the past. Well, I think that, that may be stretching it, Martin, a little bit too far. But funnily enough, I'm not sure that the links to Hamas, the links to Sinn Féin IRA, I'm not sure they're damaging him in this campaign because everyone knew it already. I th- with the younger people who won't remember the bombing and the bullets, it probably won't with them. But with the older people and people in you know 40 and plus who do remember all the carnage and the mayhem, they'll remember what Corbyn said. And well, good luck. Well, they may well. So, so, Martin, do I take it from this call that you are reluctantly going to say that Theresa May is your answer? Yes, if if it's a straight choice between her yep. and Jeremy Corbyn, that there is no way that man can be Prime Minister of our great country. OK, Martin, thank you. Couldn't be clearer. On text I get, I cannot believe anyone could think that Corbyn is the danger to our national security. He isn't the one who thinks the answer to everything is more war, says James. Well, in fact, he made that speech the other day and the Tories really attacked him back hard. Interesting that polling suggested that over half the country agree that actually our foreign policy interventions have made things worse. And can I just say that when we're talking about Libya, and of course Libya is at the heart of the Manchester bombing, the fact that so many people from that Didsbury mosque were involved in the campaign to get rid of Gaddafi uh, and and, and have gone on to become ISIS sympathisers or terrorists. And who was on their side? chap called Cameron chap called Sarkozy. You think about it. Actually, by getting rid of Gaddafi, the bombing raids that were led predominantly by the British and French governments with the backing of the Americans, we actually have made the situation worse, not better. Please, if you disagree with that, you can call me on 0345 6060 973. Uh, Andy from Dagenham says, Hi Nigel, I would reluctantly want May in control of our security, as Corbyn would be a disaster. What does Mohammed in Wembley think? Mohammed, good evening. Hi there, thank you. It's been a very interesting discussion so far. Um, I find it extremely surprising uh, in some senses that people could genuinely think May is somewhat better on the counterterrorism front. Mm-hmm. The reality is, um, in terms of her public image, you're right, she does seem to be somewhat more strong character, maybe possibly more aggressive and, and holds a stronger stance on these issues. But it's nothing more than that. The reality is that if there's any genuine attempt to prevent terrorism on our shores in the United Kingdom, the only person, the only major politician that I've heard genuinely look to prevent this happening in the past maybe decade or so is Jeremy Corbyn. And the reason for that is, very simply, is because we all know, especially in intelligence agencies know, that this radicalism, this radical version of Islam, which kills more Muslims, by the way, than West. Yes, no, no, it was a very fair it point. It comes directly from Gulf states and Saudi Arabia in specific. 
And the very fact is May's busy defending our relationship with Saudi Arabia, of which those arms and those weapons and the funds that go to those states are used to propel and further create more of this radical Wahhabi Tikfiri mentality, which thinks that, you know, anybody you disagree with, you can kill. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we have some of this ideology that's affecting me as a British Muslim in the United Kingdom. Me as a British Muslim in the United Kingdom. So, so Mohammed, I get... These radicals. Listen, I understand that. I, yeah. I, and I've argued that on this programme. I've argued Agreed. that... That, that it is from Saudi Arabia that much of the funding of these dangerous mosques come from. But are you exactly. telling me that Corbyn would get tough on that? Yes, I am, because Corbyn seems to be uh, willing to genuinely consider decoupling the close ties with the United Kingdom and the Saudi state. And if you're able to decouple those ties, then there's actually much more room to manoeuvre to be able to clamp down on Saudi okay. funding of these entities. You make a very... Interesting point, Mohammed. Thank you. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, and it's 7.15. So a week on from the monstrous, horrible attack in Manchester, security and safety are very much on the agenda for this general election. And I'm asking you, under which leader would we be safest? And Theresa May is talking tough, and she's going to appoint a czar to deal with terrorism. And we're going to hear a lot more from her later on this evening in that, in that so-called debate. It's not a debate, because they're not head-to-head. -head. But we'll hear more from her at Hubber State tonight on that, as we will from Jeremy Corbyn, who's made it clear he would put big increases into funding for MI5, MI6 and the police force. Uh, the leader of the Green Party, Caroline Lucas, um, has defended her opposition to mass online surveillance, saying the security services should focus on targeted measures. That's very much the line that Tim Farron has been coming up with on behalf of the Lib Dems. And Nick Clegg has added this extra dimension, saying that he's really concerned that us pulling out of the European Union means we will not be able to access the big Schengen database of suspected terrorists, criminals, traffickers, etc. And the leader of UKIP, Paul Nuttall, um, who is being interviewed as we speak, has made it clear he wants a return of the death penalty. And he wants it for child killers, but equally he wants it for terrorists. He suggests that the two men that butchered Lee Rigby in the street should be put to death for doing that. And on the other big debate we had last week, what to do about the 3,500 high-priority jihadi suspects? Well, uh, when Nuttall was asked whether he thought there should be the detention without trial um, of these suspects, namely internment, he said he wouldn't take anything off the table. So I think that's the position of all the party leaders. Uh, now, it may change over the course of the next 11 days. Uh, I, as I said earlier on this show tonight, uh, for my own part, I felt we should have been cracking down on this. I mean, it was obvious to me that anybody from this country that went to fight in Syria should have their passport taken away from them and burnt and not be allowed back into the country. Oh, no, you can't do that, I was told. They'd be stateless. They wouldn't have a state, to which my answer was, well, they'd have Islamic State, because that's who they've been to fight for. And yet we learn today that despite the fact we've had the power to do this for the last couple of years, Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, admitted today that of the more than 400 people that have gone and fought for ISIS in Syria and come back to Britain, we've stopped the grand total of one. That's right, just one. I mean, you really couldn't invent this stuff. So I'm feeling a bit down about it. Maybe Nicola in Cheltenham is going to tell me something that will inspire me and make me think she's going to vote for a leader that will solve all of this. Good evening, Nigel. Good evening. Nice to speak to you. Hi. I, I've got to say, I feel similar to you. I feel very down about the whole thing. Yes. I think. It, is, it is very worrying, isn't it? It is. The figures are just shocking. And the fact that, I mean, I, I see so many people today on social media and just generally everywhere I'm coming to contact with um, condemning their own armed forces. And so we were with the thing that Jeremy Corbyn keeps saying, I'll tell you what, well. Nicola, Nicola, I'm keen to speak to you. I really am. But that phone line is rotten. So I'm going to go to Jill in Otley in West Yorkshire. Jill, good evening. Good evening, 
Nigel. How are you? Well, I'm all right, Jill, but I'm, 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 I'm looking for inspiration, Jill. I, I'm, I want you to tell me, who is the leader that's going to well, sort out this desperate problem? The leader said that anyone who goes to fight in Syria mm-hmm. um, will have their passport taken off them, and it hasn't happened. It hasn't but happened. For start, that's not inspiring for Theresa May. Mm. Um, I'm pretty annoyed that you also said that these people, as in immigrants, um, hold passports like us, speak our language. Um, a lot of my friends are Muslim who hold passports. Well, when I said these language. people, I meant people who are terrorists. I didn't mean people who were Muslim. I didn't mean people... Of, uh, no, that wasn't what well, I was talking you about. You could make that clear when you said that. Well, well what you got was... are being attacked at the moment. Yeah, Jill, what you got, Jill, was one small clip of a big press conference I did back in 2015. But all right, I take the point. And look, I'm sure there's verbal abuse flying around all over the place in our towns and cities right now. I say a friend of mine and her little sister was in that uh, Manchester bombing. Yeah. They went to see the uh, concert. Yes. Uh, Thankfully, they were both fine. Uh, Very traumatised, but both fine. Mm. And uh, that being said, you know, a close friend as well, I've known her since she was a child. Um, I think the only person who can get us through this is Jeremy Corbyn. He's He's proven himself already with Ireland. Him and John McDonald, despite them being shot down in flames over it, are the only people to actually resolve anything through peace talks. That's never been done anywhere else in the world. Well, I didn't see... I didn't notice they were involved in the peace talks. I mean... Well, they're being, oh, well apparently they're sympathisers and everything because they've had to do things with them. Yeah, they had peace talks with them. Well, they met them repeatedly over decades and, and some would say, Jill, uh, very distastefully in the wake of the Brighton bombing in 1984, uh, that perhaps they met with representatives of those organisations far too quickly. Uh, however, what is true is that John Major, when he was Prime Minister, despite saying he would never do so, was secretly having talks with the IRA, a process which, of course, Tony Blair continued and repeated. Um, but I don't... That's the only way forward, and I'm not, trust me, I'm not a fan of Tony Blair, but that is the only way forward, is peace talks. Do you know, since the Second World War, do you know how many days of peace we've had in the entire world? Go on, Joe. 66. 66. Now, I doubt we've even had that, to be honest with you, but but OK, I'll That's take you on. So are you suggesting, have. Jill, Jill, I mean, are you, are you suggesting that Prime Minister Corbyn would hold talks with ISIS, peace talks with ISIS? Yeah, yeah I am, and I, I actually am. I think not only that, but he's also willing to put more money into our police and our I, 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 no, I completely understand the point. Theresa Mason doesn't that... but cut it. And do you know what? As far as I'm concerned, MI5, who were the only ones who actually... Uh, sorry, GCHQ were the, only, who were the only ones who actually got extra money and didn't do anything about this. Yeah, I mean, equally, you know, Nuttall's talking about 20,000 more police. Corbyn's talking about a lot more resources. But I want to get back to this point. You know, who would you, who would you negotiate with? Would you negotiate with church leaders? Would you negotiate with military commanders? I mean, how many different countries? I mean, I mean, ISIS, ISIS is leaders, uh, but, but, but ISIS leaders, is a sort of multi-headed hydra, isn't it? Different bits of it exist in all sorts of different countries, and equally, it isn't just ISIS, is it? There are all sorts of different strains of extremism that exist within this. I, I mean, it was obvious, wasn't it? With Sinn Fein IRA, we all knew who the leaders were. It was quite simple. I don't think it's as simple as that, dealing with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or anyone like that. There was Al-Qaeda, Taliban, ISIS, um, and we know where they, they're all getting their sort of their funding from, uh, which is sort of as a result from the West anyway. But you feel, um, Jill, you feel that I Corbyn... Do. So could, do, yeah. would, 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 would Prime Minister Corbyn sort of broker a, a global peace conference with jihadi terrorists? I actually do believe he can do that. Well, Jill, it's... Uh, it's a very strong, interesting point of view, and I thank you for it. I, I've never heard that before. Interesting. Um, hello, Nigel. I think Corbyn will improve our security by strengthening the police and security services. It's hard to have confidence in May because of her six years of failure on security and migration, says Paul in Surbiton. Uh, on Twitter, I get there is no viable alternative to the Tory party in this election. Nigel, we do not trust any of our political parties in Whitehall, says June. Evening, Nigel. Why every time there is a terrorist attack the next day, the new states, the attacker was on the watch list. Andy and Derby. Do you know what, Andy? 
isn't that the case almost every single time? Not just here, but in France or Belgium or wherever else it may be. Which does lead Andy and Derby to that question we were talking about on Thursday night. What on earth do you do with 23,000 people? I mean, at the moment, at the moment, there are about 4,000 people full-time employed watching just over 3,000 who are on the danger list. How much more money would be needed to monitor and follow 23,000? I'm told that full-time surveillance of any one individual costs about a million pounds per year per person. Just to give you some idea of perspective on this. Uh, Santi, in Stratford-upon-Avon, who would you trust with the future security of our country? Hi, Nigel. Hi. Um, I wouldn't trust either of the two major political parties, but could I just make a a point, please, what I think really needs to be done and is not being done? No, go on. There are two issues. One is at home and abroad. At home, the the underlying issues that are contributing to what's going on is not being tackled. You know, the underlying problems are, you know, I'm an immigrant who have been here for over 45 years, and one of the things is, you know, this thing about cultural diversity, I think you mentioned this about rubbing people's noses in it, and Mandelson had a go at you quite, and oh, quite yes. fairly. Oh, yes. I remember that very well. Now, the problem is if people don't integrate, they become a threat, and then there becomes other issues. Now, I, the, for a start, we need to tackle schools. I, I do think the growth in religious schools has contributed to a lot of radical Islam now. Fine. Uh, and I think religion as a whole, religious schools as a whole, is not a good idea. At least we should stop new ones. And any older ones that are causing a problem should be closed. I think, you know, subjecting children to this sort of brainwashing is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Similarly, if there are any mosques or any religious organization, not just Islam, anyone that is promoting anything, I think they should be shut. We should be stricter with that, any organization. You know, I think we should stop bending backwards to accommodate people when it does not fit with the culture of this country. I mean... Why allow Sharia law? In, in a, it's not a democratic law. It's not one the parliament has voted for. And people seem to be bending backwards to accommodate these things. These are the things that lead... To well, problems. Theresa May actually said she thought Sharia courts I could, know, I know, could, but, could, but could play a positive role. And then you pay the, you pay the price, mm. and that's what people are doing. Mm. Now, on, a, on a global level, you know, we need to remove uh, so one of the main root causes, I think, of of problems with um, with uh, terror groups, and that is Palestine. I really do think the people of Palestine have had a raw deal with the creation of Israel. That problem has created a hornet's nest of trouble. That needs to be tackled head-on. We need to have a... Split. Yeah, I mean, I, Sandy, that's a whole separate debate. Although, I have to say, President Trump wants to be the peace broker uh, between the Israeli state and the Palestinians. Whether he can or not, I don't know. Sandy, I thank you very much for your call. I agree with you. We need action, not words. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.30. We're debating security and which leader standing in this election best you think will make us the right place to be in terms of our future safety. And we're also, at the top of the hour, going to be previewing tonight's debate. Sadly not head-to-head, but at least Mrs May and Mr Corbyn will get quizzed by members of the public. That'll be on from half past eight until ten, and you can listen to it all here live on LBC. And just one little comment from Europe. Angela Merkel is out campaigning because, of course, the Germans have their elections in September. Um, She gave a a sort of big speech at a conference and was pictured with a stein of beer. Um, And what she said was interesting. She said on Saturday that Europe now had to fight for its own destiny. That's not Germany's destiny. That's not France's destiny. It's Europe's destiny. And she says that because, and I quote, of Brexit and the election of Trump. So uh, there is a feeling uh, that somehow they're all being left behind. uh, And therefore, uh, just as Mr Juncker has said before, they have to go full steam ahead for complete integration of the Eurozone. And she certainly got Mr Macron from France to back her up on this, that they want to have their own Eurozone parliament, their own Eurozone finance minister, and equally, it's full steam ahead for the European army, which means people will not be paying 2% of their budget towards defence, which means the future of NATO is genuinely threatened. It is not Donald Trump that poses a threat the future of NATO, it is Juncker and Merkel. 
I will come back to that. Um, or if you've got any strong thoughts on it, please call me on that subject. But back to which leader would be best for the future safety of the country. Stephen on Facebook says it's got to be May. Corbyn won't fight back. He wants to sit around a table and talk to the terrorists. Stu says Corbyn and his team are the ones for me. Tack says I want JC to take the nation back to the 1970s when we were out of the EU. I only trust him. Hmm. Chris says the only safe choice is May as the alternative doesn't bear thinking about and on text. Uh, Graham says Corbyn has proved himself incapable of dealing with terrorists uh, and he wants to talk to ISIS. What kind of idiot is he? Well, you know, previous caller thought that actually you have to talk to terrorists and indeed the Good Friday Agreement was a culmination not just of Tony Blair's government talking to the IRA but indeed John Major's government talked to the IRA whilst publicly saying they would never do any such thing. I think, though, talking to ISIS or Al-Qaeda or any of these other organisations is a rather more difficult problem. Ben in Maidstone, good evening. Who would you trust most for our future security? Good evening, Nigel. It has to be Jeremy Corbyn, absolutely. There's no, there's no comparison. I think at the moment there's a lot of scaremongering going on in the press. Some people are actually, if you listen to what they're saying, they're actually just repeating almost verbatim what they've been told to say by by the press. Um, and I think that, that everything that we sort of see in the news, it tends to be the opposite is actually true. Strong and stable equals a nervous Oh, but, but, but Mrs May is strong and stable, surely, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time, I, every time I see her, she looks like a nervous wreck on television. Now, she looks like she's absolutely <laughs> petrified. And, and the, the total opposite of, of, of strong and stable. Um, I think also that... Um, you know, if, if you're going to be if you're going to be saying that you, you're going to be keeping the country safe, then why uh, get rid of 20,000 policemen? Why get rid of uh, fire stations? Why get rid of uh, police stations? Why do deals with the Saudis who who fund, influence, and everything else? ISIS that you know. All ISIS right, actually, all right, all right, Ben. More or less same. Ben, ben uh, you've written yeah. Mrs. May off. You've done it really effectively. Now tell me why Corbyn would be good. Okay, Corbyn is um, is, is a person that actually. Uh, has a reasoned argument. You know, he sort of thinks things through rather than sort of going to, you know, the, the, the whole, the whole, uh, you know, May thing. Is very, and and most of the most of the, of the politicians tend to just be very reactive and very much sort of all guns blazing and everything else and, and trigger happy sort of responses. Corbyn actually thinks about the long term implications of any action rather than just do something and just you know just, and just get that done now and then don't worry about it. I mean, you know, by going into Iraq, by going into Libya. By going to these places, we definitely have opened up a can of worms. And we I, Ben, that. Ben, I, I completely accept that under Prime Minister Corbyn, yeah. we would not yeah. be getting involved in exercises like Libya, which clearly made the terrorist situation worse, not better. Absolutely. Understand, Absolutely. understand, Absolutely. understand. But other than that, you know, I've looked through what he's had to say about terrorism, and apart from giving more money to MI5, to MI6, and to the police... I can't see a single positive proposal. Um, well, you know, I just think that, that he would actually just look at the situation, think it through carefully, and I think I trust him more to make the right decision because history has proven that he's, he's made the right decision more often than not. And I think all this talk about sort of people digging up stuff about the IRA, you know, listen, we, we've, we've moved on 35 years ago. I don't think Jeremy Corbyn, he, he actually believes maybe in, in, a, in a sort of united island, but I don't believe that he actually thought that, 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 that uh, bombs were, were the right way. I think he actually tried. Mm. I think people need to give him credit for actually being brave enough to meet with people who might have distrusted him and, and thought that, you know, he could be a spy, he could be whatever, you know, to go into the lion's den and have discussions. But Diane Abbott, said some, Diane Abbott said some pretty extraordinary things 30 years ago, didn't she? I don't actually know what she said, to be honest. So you might have to sort of... Uh, well, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, it's back in the early, mid-1980s and she says right. that, that any victories in Ireland against the British state are a victory for us all. Okay. All well, right, let's well, tell you what, Ben, let's forget about that. It was 35 years ago. All right, I tell, I'll agree with you. We'll write it off as, it, as being 35 years ago. But I, is, is Corbyn the sort of man who you can see in a crisis really being tough? Of course, of course. You know, the thing is, you know, there's, there's a different sort of uh, response, you know, in terms of 
been tough. People assume that we're going to sort of go in on a horse. Uh, you know, they see leadership as being someone on a horse. That sort of medieval sort of uh, idea of what a leader is on a horse with a sword up in the air, sort of charging into battle. There's other ways of being a strong leader, and I think that some of the ideas he has mm-hmm. are different and a different approach. Like, you know, where where do the where do ISIS get their weapons from? How, who do they supply? oil to and you know do things like that i think there's ways that he can cut okay. off and tell me ben are you are you normally a labor voter um to be honest i've, I've flipped uh between between the parties but for me jeremy corbyn is the, is the biggest breath of fresh air that i've uh, that i've encountered okay uh, since, ben, I, since i've been in politics ben you've made the point absolutely beautifully i thank you very much indeed jody in portsmouth who would you trust jody definitely not corbyn right <laughs> um I've seen just some worrying things online, uh, well, not specifically about Corbyn, but I did see a video today of John McDonnell actually promoting political violence. So, oh, where was I, that? It was just, it, you can type it in on YouTube and you can find it, but he, was, he mm. actually used the word insurrection to push the movement forward. Well, so Jody, I, I you know, I mean I have to admit, I have to admit, I you know, I did talk about the formation of a people's army to bring down the establishment over Brexit. So you can perhaps misinterpret. But I understand that completely and I have thought about things, you know, what happened with Katie Hopkins this week, you know, people weren't happy about the words she used. Yeah. But the word insurrection, actually the dictionary definition is to use violence against authority and the government. So it's not so much Labour getting in and what they would do for security. All right. Well, you know, like we can also have polit- political insurrections as well. But, 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 Jody, uh, okay, you you've clearly got reservations about the Labour the Labour leadership team. Um, what 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 positive things do you think Mrs May is going to do to deal with the fact there are now twenty three thousand people in this country who the security services have been looking at in some way? I really don't know. I just think the debate needs to become much more honest than what it is currently. And our leaders just do need to try and get some courage up to talk about this honestly, because otherwise we are going to lose everything that we've got. And it's really sad. Mm. So so you're feeling pretty down about the whole situation too, yeah? Yeah, and I'm struggling to decide who to to vote for. You know, I'm I'm a true kipper. I'm a very proud kipper. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to split the vote. Uh, because I don't want Labour to get in. Whose vote would um, you split? Well, I'm thinking if I vote um, UKIP with my heart, I'm going to split the Conservative vote. And the polls are going up, but you don't know if you can trust the polls and things like that. Mm. So it, it, just... It's a really odd one, Jodie, because, you know, a lot of people said ahead of 2015, ah, if you vote UKIP, you'll split the Conservative vote and help the Labour Party. Actually, actually, in 2015... I've no doubt in my mind that the Conservatives won seats that they would not have won because because UKIP was hurting the Labour Party more in those seats. It's a tough one. Jody. I'll leave you thinking about what to do. A uh, suggestion on text that if Corbyn went to talk to ISIS, we would not see him again. Uh, Nigel, can we bring Trump over to sort things out? At least he hacks and tries to sort things. Not like our leaders who just seem to talk, says... Kathy, I think actually uh, Trump's had a very good tour, a very good nine day tour around the world, but he perhaps has gone back to a few problems of his own in Washington that he needs to deal with. Uh, Corbyn's already said he wouldn't talk to ISIS. End of the argument, says Lee on Twitter. Well, even if he wanted to talk to ISIS, who would you talk to? I, you know, I keep coming back to this question. Um, Corbyn's going to dedicate more money to MI5 and 6. They don't need it. They're doing a great job, and they've so far identified the 3,500 plus the extra 20,000. What we need is a leader that's going to throw them all out, says Roy. Well, there you are. Lots of strong opinions. I was, in terms of talking tough, I thought the mo- most interesting intervention over the course of the weekend uh, was Tariq Gafur, the former assistant uh, commissioner at Scotland Yard, um, who actually proposed and said that we're going to need to intern the radical extremists, meaning up to 3,500 people. And I thought that for somebody who'd been a very senior policeman, and indeed um, uh, during his time, I think I'm right in saying the most certainly the most senior Asian policeman in the Met, if not in the whole of the United Kingdom. It was a particularly interesting and strong comment. Um, Alex in Newcastle, which leader would you trust with the future safety and security of our great nation? 
still owed anybody but Jeremy Corbyn. Right, OK. Well, who then? Well, I think it's this time it's got to be Theresa May. Um, I think she's... Um, the Tories themselves have got a pretty good um, history uh, with regards to the security services. You know, they've boosted funding for the security services quite a lot over the past five years, which what, is whilst, definitely presented... A, is that whilst cutting police budgets? Possibly, yes, absolutely. Um, I think it's a shame, really, that they've they've cut police budgets during this time because, you know, we need extra police out on the streets as well. Um, And and they've cut the army, Alex, and the navy, and the air force, quite, I mean, quite radically. Quite quite radically. I'm not too happy about that either. Um, But if you face, you know, realistically speaking, it's either going to be Corbyn or Theresa May who's going to get into power. Uh Jeremy Corbyn has consistently showed that he wants to cut the armed forces even more than has been done. You know, throughout his whole career, he's shown that he's completely against the the army, the armed services. Um, And he's consistently in Parliament voted against extra powers for the security services. So he's just shown he's been a pacifist, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, Alex, I've got Anthony on Facebook says, Corbyn blocked anti-terrorism legislation for years. Tough, really? So absolutely, there are other people too making that point. So it's going to be Theresa May for you, is it, Alex? Um, yeah, ideally, ugh, ideally, it's not going to happen, but UKIP, um, I think they're the only one throwing out a radical solution here, which is internment. You know, when you've got 23,000 people on the watch list and you've got this guy in Manchester who was known to the security services, everyone's asking, well, if he was known to the security services, how on earth was he allowed to do what he did? Mm, well, it's because what? you cannot possibly monitor 23,000 people and not expect a few to slip through the net. It's, there's a huge challenge we face. Alex, I thank you, and equally, you know, we've equally got the Green Party and the Liberal Democrats putting their solutions forward as well. Right now, you're listening to the Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC, it's 7.45. All the party leaders have been talking about security since the outrage in Manchester that happened a week ago, Uh, and I'm asking you, which one of them do you trust most with the future security of our country. Uh, And I get this on text. Perhaps the £10 million plus this government spent keeping Julian Assange locked up in the Ecuadorian embassy for the Americans would have been better spent tracking terror groups. Corbyn, for me, anonymous. Uh, Britain will never negotiate with terrorists. We stand on principle or we will not stand at all, I get on Twitter. Well, Britain will never negotiate with terrorists. John Major was negotiating with the IRA all the time while he was telling us it would make him sick to the bottom of his stomach to talk to terrorists. But he was talking to terrorists. And there comes a point when you're looking for conflict resolution when you have to talk to terrorists. But I'm not sure it's possible to talk to the kind of ideology that we're dealing with at the moment that has so many different branches and doesn't have any clear, direct global leadership. I think it's a little bit more complicated and difficult than that. What does David and Craigerwood think? David, who would you trust most with our future security? I would trust Corbyn most, without without a shadow of a doubt. Would you? And why? what is your reason, David? So, as already been, as already been mentioned, the heads of increased funding to the MI5, MI6, uh, and to police, and put more police on our streets, which I think is, of course, sort of um, which, which would help, but rather than just attacking the sort of the manifestations of the radicalisation, he would do what May wouldn't and attack and address the root cause, which is our government's foreign intervention. He was one of eleven, I believe, MPs that voted against the intervention in Libya. Twelve, I think it was. Sort of yeah, twelve. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. An almost an almost direct like causal link between the radicalisation yeah. no. and, of course, the Manchester the Manchester attack. I must admit, David, at the time of Libya. I I wonder whether perhaps I'd gone mad. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if 640 uh, or so, 639 members of Parliament were voting for it, I wonder whether I'd lost my marbles. But actually, it was they, it was they wasn't it, that had lost their marbles. Yeah. No, and, David, I do understand, I, I, you know, I understand that under Prime Minister Corbyn, there would be no more Libyas. But, but do you actually think he would deal in this country with the issues of separation with the issues that state-sponsored multiculturalism has led to, because he's actually, in the past, appeared to be all in favour of it. I do, I do, and I think that, as we've seen with the six years of Theresa May, 
as, a, as our Home Secretary, she's done nothing to address any of the sorts. She's decreased the funding to the police. She's decreased the funding to the MI5 and the MI6. And Corbyn will do the almost sort of the antithesis to that. And I think that while she can sort of repeat her mantra that she's strong and stable and she's got through to the people who, who view her as some sort of like strong, um, like, defender of the British people, both in Europe and at home. She is not, and she's sort of evidentially been a weak leader, both at home and abroad. And I think Corbyn provides a direct alternative to that. Do you genuinely, David, do you genuinely think that Corbyn would deal with radical preachers in mosques in this country? I do. I think that he is not a perfect man, um, and he has said and done... None of us are. ...that I would would disagree with, but... I do think that he genuinely cares about the British people and his actions in the past and his 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 um well yeah his actions it's not just it's not just words like Theresa May his actions in the past where he stood up for uh, has demonstrated that he will do whatever he can to defend the British people against these sort of horrific horrific terrorists. Okay, David, you're, you're very passionate and you're a strong Corbyn supporter. Are you a Labour Party member, David? I am. You yes. are. Yeah. Well, I can see why. Thank you very much indeed, Gina in Wokingham. Who is the person? to make this country the safest it can possibly be. Hi, Nigel. Well, it's going to have to be May, isn't it? I mean, Corbyn is a complete mess, not just on foreign policy, but on every policy. I don't think any major political party is really dealing with the the actual issue, which is assimilation. Yes. We need to have more assimilation in this country, and we have to stop pretending that the words, excuse me, British, British culture are somehow offensive, racist, or xenophobic. You know, that's the problem here. When you hear British culture, you think, oh, is, well, G- uh, am I allowed to say that? Is G- that Gina, I agree with you. It? I agree, Gina. And I was arguing this with the last caller. I was saying that actually Corbyn has been one of the sponsors of multiculturalism, division, as opposed to integration within our society. So I do completely understand that point. But, Gina, whilst we're on Corbyn and foreign policy, why was Corbyn wrong about Libya? Well, the problem is it's not... It's not us, our foreign policy. It's the Islamist ideology. That's why they attack us. They're going to attack us whether we're there or not, whether we do anything or we don't. They hate our way of life, not our foreign policy. They yes. don't want to live in peace. They want you to submit. I mean, that's, that's the problem here. There is no talking to them. You can't get around the table with a cup of tea, and that's what he wants to do. You know, it's not going to happen. And you hear a lot of people talking about leaving vacuums in other countries, which allows ISIS to flourish. But we're leaving vacuums here. When we aren't helping immigrants or refugees to assimilate, we're letting people down. It has to start in the community. Well, actually, Gina, we've encouraged them to live separately and operate separately. Isn't that at the heart of what we've got so badly wrong in this country over the last 40 years and more? You come here and you don't speak the language and you don't understand the culture. I mean, it was hard for me as an American coming here. It's very different. But imagine coming from the Middle East or Africa Mm. or somewhere else where the culture is so different. What do you do? You find your people. And that's what happens. You have whole communities yeah, yeah. not assimilating into British culture, yeah. and it cannot go on like this. And do you think Theresa May did a good job as Home Secretary? Well, I'm, I hear a lot of people slamming her, but actually in 2012, she made it a, a lot harder for people to come here. She, there's only so much she could do. Obviously, she couldn't do anything about EU immigration. But she has changed some of the rules coming in here, and I think well, had she not done that, it would have been a lot hard. It would yeah. have been a lot easier. We would have more immigration than we do today. Well, she wasn't honest about EU migration because I kept no, saying, because I kept saying, surely you can't control EU migration with open borders. And answer, there came none. And whilst they did close down uh, some bogus colleges and things like that, the numbers still went up, Gina. Yes, they did. But I think they would have went up further had she not made some of the changes because the visa that I'm on is a spousal visa, and she made it. Um, She changed the amount that you need to earn before you can come in here. Now, I still think it's too low, but they promise they they make it higher. Anyway, Corbyn's the the better of the two as far as you're concerned. No, Corbyn is... (laughs) I'm teasing you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Okay. So we we want not just May over Corbyn, but we want a a genuine programme of integration in this country, yeah? Yes. Absolutely, Gina. I thank you very much indeed for your call. Anita says on Facebook, uh, not the main three, that's for sure. They are all guilty of opening the floodgates, not vetting people coming into this country. It is sheer lunacy. Rant over. Kevin says, don't trust any of them. Corbyn, the least. Uh, I'm going to ask Ali in Slough what he thinks. Who would you trust the most, Ali? 
I would trust Paul the most. Um, the reason behind that is because he's the only leader that I've heard so far to offer a radical way of tackling these people with their radical thoughts. You know, these people who go out to commit atrocities, killing young children, mowing down people who are, you know, on road when it's tourist visitors, it's just not acceptable. You know, and the only way you can deal with it, if they want Sharia law, you know, what does Sharia law say? It says you kill someone, we, you know, you, you face the death penalty yourself. So these people, if they have, if they know what the repercussions are, rather than sitting in some cushy, you know, prison, relatively speaking, to the death penalty, they're, they're going to keep doing this. And you know, in, in terms of what Theresa May, you know, on her watch so far, she's been the prime minister for less, what, less than a year, just over a year. Um, she's let two two uh, terrorist attacks take place. And now when you're asking this question, everyone's sitting there saying, well, I, I put faith in Theresa May. Yeah. On her watch, we've allowed two terrorist acts to take place. Do people not realise that? Ali, you, your point about Paul Nuttall uh, yep. is right in the sense that he's radical. You know, he is yep. saying things. He's he, In fact, his comments today have gone a lot further than any political leader in modern times exactly. has, has ever gone. Do you think, though... Uh, and don't forget, UKIP launched their campaign on this issue, didn't they? But are they right on this question of the burqa, the niqab and face coverings? Have they got that right? Well, the thing is, the way, the way I see it, you know, I'm, I'm Muslim myself in yeah. terms of, uh, you know, wearing, uh, you know, the burqa and the niqab. You know, in terms of what, what, what it states in, in terms of covering your, you know, you're, you're, you're still sure. allowed to show your face. You don't need to cover your face, you know, to the point where you're just showing your eyes. There's no need for that. And, and, and if you, you know, if you live in a country where you know this is going to cause some repercussions, I mean, the way I see it is just use a bit of common sense. Common sense says, you know, you can still, you can still conceal your modesty. Yep. Um, and and you can still you know live with society. You've, you've, rather, you've, you know, rather than you've made your position yep. beautifully clear. I thank you. That ends the debate. As I said, I'm nearly always upbeat and positive, however tough the problem. Uh, this one, I just cannot believe we've allowed things to get as bad as we have. Uh, so, in just over 30 minutes' time, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn will answer questions from a live TV audience. They'll be grilled by Paxman. They will then face a live audience through Faisal Islam, and you can hear the whole thing live on LBC. It's just over a week to go before the election. This will probably be the only time you will see them quizzed by members of the public. So get involved after the break. Call me. Tell me what you think about these two leaders. And after 8.30, Ian Collins will pick up the debate and you can follow the whole programme. Don't go away. It all starts next. So in 30 minutes' time, there will be... They're calling it the great debate. Of course, the truth is, folks, I'm sorry, there is no debate at all, in that, in that May and Corbyn will not be doing this head-to-head. -head. That isn't going to happen. But Corbyn will go first. He will be interviewed and grilled by Jeremy Paxman. He will then face, through Faisal Islam, questions and open debate with the audience. And Theresa May will follow him and do exactly the whole thing. It starts at half past eight. It ends at ten o'clock. And Ian Collins will be here taking you through, on LBC, the whole thing live. So what will be going through the minds of, of May and of Corbyn. Well, I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment, because I've been there before. But meanwhile, over to the Sky News Centre and Theo Ashwood, LBC's political editor. Theo, are you there? I am here, and I'm, to try and answer your question, Nigel, I think the one thing that will be going through both the minds of Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May is not to mess up, because, of course, what we're looking out for here, I'm, I'm not sure necessarily it will be about uh, the Jeremy Paxman interview, but it could be a key exchange in those town hall question and answer style sessions. If Theresa May faces a really tough question from a member of the audience on the so-called dementia tax, her social care yeah. reforms, that could be explosive and it could get played out on loop. Conversely, Jeremy Corbyn on his links or perceived links to the IRA. If there's a la if somebody manages from the studio audience to land a land a punch there, that could get really difficult for the Labour leader. I must admit, Theo, having been there myself with interviews and debates with Nick Clegg and debates against Cameron and the referendum and all of this, I know myself, if you're going up against a tough interviewer, you kind of can work out pretty much the direction they're going to go in. When it comes to the general public, it could go literally anywhere, so I agree with that analysis entirely. Um, are you going to interview some guests for us ahead of the um, debate opening? We are going to have some guests, hopefully have uh, David Davis, uh, the Brexit Secretary, in the next uh, quarter of an hour, and Barry Gardner as well. Just going back to that, uh, Nigel, 
you, you're quite right to say that, uh, you know, you know yourself, when you're going up against a, a journalist, you can predict the questions, you can yeah. try and plot a route. And you can also go after that journalist or that interviewer if you feel you're getting a hard time. With members of the public, you can't criticise them. You can't say they're wrong. The voting public are never wrong. So it becomes very, very difficult, difficult for, politician, yeah. for politicians to go after a member of the public. You can't do it without looking, uh, without looking as if you've, you've been had. Uh, yeah, or you're some horrible bully. Exactly. Uh, tell me, Theo, what's the buzz like in the sense that... And I'm guessing that a month ago... If you'd gone to this debate, amongst the journalists, the commentators, the public assembling, there would have been a feeling that Theresa May was strong and stable and dominant and that, and that Corbyn couldn't really do this. I'm guessing that is not quite the feeling tonight, is it? Hasn't she got more to lose than him, in a way? Absolutely. The narrative has changed. Two weeks ago, the Tories were dominant, uh, riding high in the polls. They then had their manifesto launch and the dementia tax came out and the idea that you, your children could lose the family home. That went down very badly. Mm. Jeremy Corbyn clawed back, uh, and clawed back much of the deficit in the polls. Then Manchester happened and then there's some big questions now about his links to, like I said, the IRA, to Hamas as yes. well. And, and how that's going to play out. That's going to really dominate tonight and it's going to dominate the next 10 days. Yeah. Well, let's get our listeners involved in this, um, Theo. So, LBC listeners, imagine you were sitting in that audience tonight in the Sky Newsroom uh, studios. What question would you want to ask Corbyn or May or both. What's the question you would ask? Let me know on 0345 973 You can text in, keep it clean though, 84850, or you can tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage and LBC. Theo, um, so uh, tell me, Team Corbyn, I mean, is he there with a huge entourage of people around him? Both have just arrived actually a few minutes ago. Corbyn isn't here with a huge team around him. He doesn't actually travel with that many uh, advisors uh, and, and, and other apparatchiks, so to speak. His, his team's quite small. Uh, he arrived in a people carrier after Theresa May. She arrived first, of course, in a prime ministerial convoy, uh, which she has to have as the prime minister. Uh, and she has her director of communications, uh, Fiona Hill, with her uh, as well. David Davis, as I said, Boris Johnson, the foreign secretary, uh, spinning for her tonight. And we're going to hear from David Davis shortly. Yeah. Um, for, from their point of view, they're not, and I spoke to one of her, her aides, they're not treating this overly seriously, but they don't want it to go wrong. They need to make sure that the next 10 days go well for the Conservatives. She had a soft relaunch in southwest London today. The message there, they're trying to get it back on to Brexit, back yes. on to the idea of who's <laughs> going to be negotiating. Is it when, it was on Brexit, when it was on Brexit, Theo, they were doing rather well, weren't they? Yes, of course they were, and uh, Theresa May has, has said she, you know, said from the outset she would, uh, she would deliver Brexit, but she hasn't really fleshed it out. She hasn't fleshed out what that actually means, what that success looks like, because I guess she doesn't want to make herself a hostage to, to fortune no, of course. if she doesn't get it. But she does need to, she does, I think, need to tonight and in the next ten days differentiate between what she can achieve going into those negotiations with the likes of Michelle Barnier and Guy Verhofstadt versus what Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, could get when he go if he was to win and become the, mm. the negotiator in chief, and if she can't, if, you, if she can't sort of quantify that for the British public, then it simply becomes a slogan like Brexit means Brexit or Brexit. We're going to make a success of it, and that's not going to work. Well, maybe, maybe all's going to become clear in the next couple of hours. I don't know, Theo. When you've got uh, some interviewees, please give us a call back. Meanwhile, uh, let's go to our callers. Let's go to Burkan in Sigcup. So, Burkan. Uh, what question would you like to ask? Um, the question I'd like to ask is, are you trying to lose this election on purpose? <laughs> I guess you're asking Mrs May this question, are you? I'm asking Mrs May this question. I mean, you've spoken before, Nigel. I don't know if you remember me, I do remember you, yes. I, 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 I did say she's going to lose this election on purpose. I think Brexit is a mess, no matter which direction we look at it. I think this, this, this um, thing they put forward as a, as, um, a, a no deal which is absolutely bad for the economy. I think she doesn't know what she's doing, and I think she is purposely trying to lose this election. And for her to concentrate so much on the IRA, an enemy that was, you know, 30, 40 years ago, a part of British politics, for her to concentrate so much on it, I just, I just feel as though she's trying to do the same thing with um, Sadiq Khan and the, and the London mayoral elections, and I think she's going to lose. 
Well, um, all I can say, Burkan, is there has been the most astonishing shift, if you believe them, in the opinion polls. Because at one point, I think the biggest lead I saw was 23 points in one opinion poll. I certainly saw others at 22, 20, 21. So she was, I mean, absolutely streets ahead. And I think there was one poll out on Friday that showed it being as close as five. And the opinion polls out yesterday vary between seven and 14. But, you know, whichever way you cut this, uh, she certainly has lost significantly in the polls. Um, just one point, Burke, and you said that, you know, us leaving the EU without a deal might be disastrous. It's a very interesting piece by economist Roger Bootle in the Telegraph today, basically saying, look, clearly these negotiations are going to be a total waste of time. They're not interested in talking to us. They're more interested in, in trying to preserve their political union. And that actually walking away and having no deal gives us the opportunity to cut the price of goods that we import from all over the world. And that actually consumers in this country might benefit from having no deal and the ability very quickly for us to buy cheaper food, cheaper motor cars and all the rest of it. And it's part of Britain going global and not thinking about itself as a European nation. Uh, I mean, Nigel, regarding the polls, first thing first is not even Tottenham could have blown the lead that she had. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like it, like it. But, <laughs> but you think it's deliberate, Burkan, don't you? It's, it's got to be deliberate, Nigel. And it can't be. People. Come on, it can't Nigel, be. Nigel, Nigel, she is hitting the people who are guaranteeing her the votes. She is going after the people who have said their whole life, I have been a Conservative supporter, who said, when, when, vote Conservative so that you work hard your whole life and mm. we look after you at the end. These are the people she are hit, she's hitting. And today, I, I saw it today some, on the BBC. Some woman said that we're dying in numbers disabled and mentally ill people. She said anybody who votes for the Conservatives is, is, is given a vote to publicly kill uh, disabled and uh, mentally ill people. Now, I don't know what she's playing at. I think she had the strongest hand that, that any PM well, that I, me in my lifetime have ever she seen. She did. Well, Burke, and if she's really throwing this, um, if she's really, really throwing this, uh, then you well you're going to find out just an hour to wait. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to Theo Usherwood at the Sky News Centre. Theo. And those questions are also Hello, Theo. Can you hear me? I can. Yes, Theo. Great. Hi. All right, what news? What's going on? I'm joined by uh, Barry Gardner, who's out uh, championing uh, Jeremy uh, Corbyn this evening. Barry, what's... Um... I'm championing the Labour Party and the Labour Party's leader. You've just grabbed the microphone off me. <laughs> Mr Gardner, what has Jeremy Corbyn got to do tonight? I think he's got to explain to the British people that life in the next five years is a stark choice between more austerity, where at the end of the next five years, the average person in this country will be earning £1,400 less than they are today, when we've already seen wage levels and earnings decline so that they're actually lower today, 10% lower today in real terms than they were in 2007. That's what the Conservatives are offering, more austerity, yet for under Labour, what we're seeing is people having all the things that are holding them back actually released. We're seeing more money into the schools, more money for young people who want to go into higher education. We're seeing money spent on housing to create housing and jobs. Um, we're seeing investment into our infrastructure. This is what's going to create prosperity. And the Institute of Fiscal Studies has said very clearly that our plans will grow the economy by a full percent more than the 1.9 of the Conservatives. We would be 2.9 percent growth in the economy. But, but, Theirs is one. But Theresa May wants to talk about Brexit. She's trying to make this the Brexit election, mm. and she's making this about leadership. Do you have any concerns? That you, or what would you say to Conservatives' claim that Jeremy Corbyn versus Theresa May? who you're going to put in the room to negotiate for Britain, Jeremy Corbyn wouldn't be the person. Look, Theo, you, you know very well that the people who negotiate are the Sherpas. They are the civil servants who go in, and negotiations don't happen round a table with leaders banging their fists. But, what, but what, they do direct them. No, no. What, no. what, what, what happens is they, they have literally hundreds of civil servants working out the details of every sector of the economy. But, but, but let, let's be clear about, about Brexit. The Tories have said that they want to ensure that the, the key priority in Brexit is bringing down the numbers of immigration. 
That is going to absolutely... Well, you don't even have an immigration target. Sorry, that, is, that is going to ruin our economy. And if you look at what the CBI have said, if you look at what the Federation of Small Business have said, the Institute of Directors, all of them are concerned that our companies and our, our, our firms and our factories are not ha going to have the skills and, and the people that they need to actually fill those jobs that are at the moment providing the growth in our economy. But, but two points on that. You don't have an immigration target. And when it comes to immigration, uh, you, and you're criticising bring it down to the tens of thousands, you said that freedom of movement must, must end. So I'm not quite clear what would be your alternative on that. It, look, it's very simple. Freedom of movement ends because as you leave the, the European Union, which we are going to do, um, then the internal market goes and therefore the freedom of movement within the internal market goes with it. That, that is simply a fact. Okay. Then what you've got to say is how are you going to structure your immigration policy? Are you going to try and achieve a target like Theresa May has done for the past seven years? We'll she have no target. She said she would bring it down to tens, tens of thousands. In fact, it's now at 270,000 at the beginning of this campaign. This is ridiculous. She's not managed it, to do it. it. Dropped, it's just dropped to 248,000, 84%, because I just did a story yeah, on these yeah. figures. She will hit her target by 2019 if we, can see, if we see that drop continue over the next three years. And, and neither you nor I I believe that that will happen. Um, but that, the, the, the key point here is that do you sacrifice your economy to meet some arbitrary immigration target or do you say quite rationally that you set your ec economic policy and then you let the immigration go either down or up to reflect the needs. Now what Labour has said is we want to create the jobs and the skills in this country. That's why we're introducing the apprenticeships program. That's why we're giving parity to further education colleges uh, as a opposed to universities. That's why we're training people and giving them the skills. But the way of doing it is to look to your economy first and then to let your immigration policy meet the needs of your economy. Barry Gardner, thank you very much. Well, that was Theo Usher with interviewing Barry Gardner. Um, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It is now 8.17. In less than 15 minutes, May and Corbyn will face a grilling from members of the public. Sadly, they're not head-to-head, -head, but it is the next best thing. And I'm asking you, if you were in that studio audience tonight, what is the question you would ask one or both of them? I'm going to ask Sarah in Tayside in Scotland. What would you ask, Sarah? Good evening, Nigel. Good evening. Um, what I would ask her is, what is she going to do about stopping the funding of the terrorists um, to screw the nut on them, and particularly, as you had said earlier, from the Saudis who fund extreme mosques, mm -hmm. um, which you did agree with earlier on, because I heard you quoting that. Yes. Um, and then challenging Donald Trump on the fact that he's just did a, an arms deal with the Saudis. Well, he has done a very big arm. He's he's done yeah, a very big arms deal with the Saudis. Not fooled mm. in the fact that this this is a domino effect. Those arms go out to Saudi, and then they go out to terrorists. Well, Sarah, no on one the, is stupid not to think that on the funding issue. Now, I've looked at this before and thought about it. Right? Okay. Any political party that receives money um, over a thousand pound donation, it it has to make a sort of you know, a, a, a register of it. Um, over £7,500, any political party that receives that level of donation actually has to advertise it. And I'm thinking, actually, actually, that's what we should make mosques and churches do, and that way we could crack down on terrorist funding. Sarah, I'm going to have to let you go, because I'm going back to Theo Asherwood live at the Sky News Centre. I'm joined by uh, David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, Mr Davis, I asked Barry Gardner what uh, Jeremy Corbyn had to do. I'm going to ask you, what has Theresa May got to do? Well, she has to reinforce her uh, existing strengths. She is seen as a, I'm going to say, a strong and stable leader. She's going to be... <laughs> she was just play bingo. She would get the cards bingo, out. Bingo, yeah. But no, she is seen as uh, a safe pair of hands. She's seen as somebody who can deal with the Brexit negotiations She's, uh, and face the European leaders, uh, as it were, on a, on a level, uh, a, a level playing field. So from that point of view, she should reinforce what she's already put across. She should also get across the importance of this election. This is the Brexit election, in, in one sense at least. Whoever... A couple of weeks ago, it was a dementia tax election. No, no, no. It, it's, the, it's, a, it's a Brexit election because within 11 days of the conclusion of this election, whoever wins will be uh, facing Michel Barnier and Jean-Claude Juncker and uh, all of the other European leaders across the table. There's no time to say, oh, hold, we, we can take time out. 
it's got to be done, it's got to be underway. And so she must persuade people, as I'm sure she will, that she is the right person to lead that negotiation. But we're a little bit unclear, aren't we, about what the difference, what the material difference is between a Theresa May-led Brexit negotiation and a Jeremy Corbyn-led no, Brexit negotiation. No, we're not remotely unclear about what the... But uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of what it means for the European Court of Justice, what it means for immigration... Well, no, from, from us, it's very clear, that's the point. I mean, we are saying no European Court of Justice rule in the UK. We're saying control of immigration and bringing it down in, 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 uh, over time. We're saying that we accept that we will not be members of the single market or members of the customs union, but we want a free trade agreement with a customs agreement which allows us access both ways, will, will help us, but also help the European Union. Those are very explicit things. We've got 100 pages of explicit proposals in, uh, in, in existence already. The other side of the coin, the Labour side of the coin, it's not clear whether they want to be members of the single market or not. It's not clear what their line on immigration is. It's changed seven times over the course of the, 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 the last ten months. Uh, we're not at all clear on what their stance on the European Court of Justice is. Now, people voted last year to leave the European Union, to take back control of our laws, to take back control of our money, to take back control of our borders, our immigration. That was clear, and that what we are doing is carrying out that instruction. The Labour Party is dithering all over the place on it. Do you think this election gives Theresa May the licence to pull the plug on and revert to W World Trade Organisation rules if it goes badly? What? What? This? No, that's not the. That's not the. Aim. No, but you, you, you no. need you need that threat, don't what, you? Without what, that threat, what we, what, what Barnier what and Co. can shrug what, their shoulders. What we have said in terms. What we have said in terms is number one. We want a free trade agreement, and we think that's the most likely outcome. But in order to achieve that, we have to have the right to walk away. You're quite right. And we have said, and if it's a terrible deal offered, that's what we'll do. Labour have said the opposite. They will not walk away under any circumstances. And it's like if you're buying a house. If you could buy a house and you walk in and say. This is a fantastic house. Whatever price you charge, I'm going to buy it. You're going to pay a high price. If you buy a car, the same. You buy anything, the same. This is a deal which we have got to strike from a position of strength. That's what we'll do. But you haven't set out explicitly what that could mean in terms of walking away. And, and that could mean, you know, reverting, as it's been described, as a Singapore-style economy with next to nothing in terms of a welfare system, major cuts to the NHS, because you'd have to slash corporation tax, wouldn't you? No, no, you but you would have slashed corporation tax, no, no, no. almost to single figures, to create that economy on the outskirts no, of the no, European you're Union. Sort of imagining all sorts of policies wouldn't exist. I mean, you don't need to do that. I mean, the simple truth of the matter is, corporation tax today is as low as it's ever been. And guess what? The corporation tax take is higher than it's ever been. Why? Because companies come here. We've got companies coming here now. Apple, you know, um, uh, the uh, McDonald's, uh, you've got uh, SoftBank buying into, buying into Arm, all these companies and many, many more all coming here. They don't know the outcome of the negotiation, but they know this is a good place to do business. That's the point. Not about slashing this or that or the other, but about making this a good place to do business. We'll do that whatever happens. David Davis, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, there we are. You've heard the spinners for both sides. Uh, it's, in less than 10 minutes' time, this debate will begin. And I wonder how they'll both be feeling. I remember last year uh, doing a head-to-head -head with David Cameron uh, on ATV. I say head-to-head. -head. Cameron, again, refused to debate me head-to-head, -head. refused to debate anyone head-to-head. -head. He did one with Michael Gove on Sky, one with me on, on ITV during the referendum. And it was funny because not only would he not debate me, he didn't even want to meet me in the corridor. And when we did accidentally meet in the corridor, he didn't like it. Um, I have to say, he was the Prime Minister. He looked more nervous than I did. And that was because he had more to lose, in a sense, than I did. And my guess is tonight, Theresa May will be the more nervous of the two. So we're going to find out very soon. The debate starts... At half past eight, you can hear all of it in full here on LBC, and then you can have your say on how they fared with Ian Collins. You've been listening to an extended Nigel Farage show exclusively on LBC. This is LBC. You know the drill. Put your savings in the bank, earn interest, feel utterly underwhelmed. It's time to talk to Cufflink, the award-winning peer-to-peer company. They're not a bank, but are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. You lend your money with theirs onto property loans, and you can get up to 7.2% gross interest on the whole.